and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Giselle Donnelly, and I'm a senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute. I'm joined by my colleagues. Yulia Zoja with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington Universities. And Dalibu Rohaj, also with AEI. On our podcast, we talk about the many security and political challenges that have arisen along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, what we call the Eastern Front. Today, it's just going to be the three of us. We're going to be discussing the assassination attempt on Slovak leader Robert Fico, and we have our in-house Slovak expert, Dalibor, who's going to help us unravel this evolving story. But if you enjoy the show, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us wherever you, you get your podcasts. We will also link to a great piece that Dalibor had trying to put this act in some context in the show notes. So with that, let's just get to it. Dalibor, why don't you set us up, give us your initial thoughts about how to think about the assassination attempt on Mr. Fico. So I'll probably start on a somewhat flippant note, but but it is only to make a serious point, which is the unpredictability of events in, in sort of politics and, and geopolitics and how very often we are caught off guard witnessing things we had no idea we would witness. So if somebody told me 36 hours ago that today I would wake up at five in the morning worrying about the health of Robert Fico, a figure for whom I have very little sympathy in normal times, I would think that that's just outside the realm of possibilities. But that's what happened this morning. And it looks like he is going to pull through. I mean, he uh, was in a very long surgery, suffered multiple wounds, and and hopefully he's on demand. So, so yesterday, on Wednesday the 15th, Slovak cabinet had a cabinet meeting outside of the capital in a small mining town in central Slovakia. Outside the cabinet meeting, the prime minister walked to sort of shake people's hands. And there was somebody who shouted at him, you know, how about you come here and and, and shot him. It's not clear how many times, but have been four or five times, actually. And and so he was rushed into a hospital in the sort of neighboring large city, operated on. Uh, he is in intensive care. And it's something that, that really shook Slovaks to the core, because this is the sort of stuff that not only only rarely happens in Europe or in the Western world. In fact, there is evidence that political violence and assassinations have been declining since mid-century. You have to go back to, I guess, like 1980s to Olaf Palme's assassination to find a sort of precedent in European politics. In Slovak or Czechoslovak politics, you really have to go back century, I guess, to find a sort of similar situation of a sort of sitting government official being shot at. So it is distressing. At the same time, I think one thing that should serve as a warning to the Western world is, is that it seems seems like a direct byproduct of the sort of overwrought polarization and, and sort of emotions driven politics that have taken root in Slovakia in which there is a real crisis of civility. I mean, all the metrics of sort of political societal polarization are you know rising so so i guess it doesn't really take much for somebody to you know self radicalize online have access to a gun this person it seems had a gun legally he was a former security guard at the supermarket and so so it might not take a lot for somebody to you know try something like this so that is that is worrying obviously there are questions about where the country goes from here but for now i guess we'll have to sort of hope that that robert fito you know for whom again i have very little sympathy makes it and that the country somehow finds a way forward that's constructive. Talk to us about Robert Fico and how we should understand his role in Slovak politics. He's been around for quite some time. He's very famous even outside of Slovakia, maybe not here in Washington, but certainly in Europe. For those who follow politics, they know his name. And I'll throw one thing out there for you to wildly contest or or explain to us more about that. This was in the analysis of European media, mainstream media, saying well, Slovakia is so polarized that half of the population, though it shook, is blaming Robert Fico and his aggressive rhetoric for this to have escalated. Does that make any sense to you? So I'll take that last question first. It does make sense to me in the same way you could imagine a similar scenario unfolding in the United States where somebody like Donald Trump 
Trump is obviously, you know, triggering very strong emotions on both sides, and he really is bringing out the worst in his supporters, and oftentimes the worst in his opponents as well. And and Robert Fico similarly, I don't, I don't think there is any denying that he has been a major, if not the most important contributor to the polarization that you that you see in Slovakia. Immediately, sort of seizing on topics that he knew would trigger some sort of primal reactions in in his electoral base, whether it's immigration, whether it's the war in Ukraine. I mean, he very much sort of seized on on the topic of the war, presenting himself as the sort of proponent of peace, as opposed to those who want to drag Slovakia in, into a war. But to maybe give a little bit of background on, on him, so he is somebody who obviously has been the central figure of Slovak politics for the past 20 years, leading the largest, most successful political party in the country. He started his journey on the political left, so he was this sort of young, up-and-coming lawyer in the 80s from a small town, maybe 100 miles away from, from Bratislava. I suppose first in his family to sort of get to university and sort of make it in the in the big city. He joined the Communist Party in the 80s. He was a member of parliament throughout the 1990s in the what was then the sort of reformed Communist Party, the, the, the party of the democratic left, as they called themselves. Throughout the region, you had these sort of political parties that were kind of rebranded former Communist parties, sort of like shedding the totalitarianism and, and, and the sort of sickle and hammer and pretending to be social democrats. So he was in that party. And then he broke away at the end of the 1990s to start his own political party, which was partly a reaction to these social democrats joining a governing coalition that had to do difficult pro-market, pro-EU reforms to get the country back on track, because Slovakia was kind of lagging behind throughout the 1990s. So, so he started his own party, which already had the sort of populist bent in the sense that he was a critic of the sort of neoliberal market capitalism, and you know they, they are going after our social safety nets, and people deserve big handouts, and that was kind of one of the themes. But at the same time, he was also styling it after the third way social democracy new labor bill clinton tony blair style of politics young and fresh and non dogmatic so it was Vito in the in the sort of early noughties and and obviously he is a very adaptive figure and so he's been sort of picking and choosing topics that played to his strengths over time and that especially over the course of the past decade after 2010 or so turned him into a figure that sort of combines this emphasis on big government handouts redistribution with nationalism and you know very strong anti-immigrant rhetoric so he was one of those leaders in 2015 who opposed the EU's asylum seeker relocation scheme and and throughout his career there was this sort of pro-Russian anti-Western bent flavor to his politics which resonates in Slovakia and again, like you have to sort of wonder, this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem, like, you know, whether he's responding to the demands of his constituents or shaping those demands himself. It's probably a little bit of both. And today, and I think part of the blame goes to Fico, is, is that Slovakia has one of the most, if not the most pro-Russian public opinion in the European Union, blaming the West and Ukrainians themselves on the war, you know, being unwilling to help Ukraine and so on and so forth. So that is Robert Fico in a nutshell. The other important thing, and I'll, I'll stop here monologuing, is, is that he obviously made a comeback in October last year and he came back to power determined to I suppose follow the Orban model of incumbent entrenchment protecting himself and his cronies from from criminal prosecutions and and now there's been sort of talk about basically revoking the status of of public broadcasting corporation turning it into a sort of arm of government that means sort of all all kinds of sort of things on many different fronts including the foreign agents law which is now being contentious issue in, in, in Georgia so there is a piece of legislation in the pipeline in Slovakia as well, modeled after that that example. And and so there was a wave of public protests against Fito following his election, which he won and formed a coalition that has a sort of majority mandate to govern. But, but the sort of emotions have been running high since since the election. Dalibor, I would like to actually ask you about a few other elements, particularly of Fito's revival. I think it's worth reminding people sort of why he lost power in the first place. There was a very controversial case of a journalist and his wife being murdered. I don't think it was ever demonstrated clearly that Fiso had any particular hand in it, but I'm sure you can recall the details better than I. And also, it seems to me there's more than nationalism in his populism. There's an element of cultural conservatism and particularly like anti-LGBT themes that we see, you know, in Orban's case, certainly in Vladimir Putin's case. This is a tried and true element of the Euro- 
MAGA playbook, so to speak. So does it make sense to wind those themes into the picture as well? No, I think it, it does make sense. So so he was first ousted in, in 2018 following a wave of public protests again after the murder of Jan Kuciak and his fiance Martina Kushnirova. So, so Kuciak was a journalist who was covering all kinds of corruption stories. Again, I don't know like how they have sort of any sort of like legal protection against people who want to sue us, but it looks like the murder was ordered by a local mobster who had, you know, very good political connections. That's a sort of short version of the story. I mean, the mobster who's in jail for other things might sort of, you know, disagree and, and, and send his lawyers our way, but that's my understanding of the situation. But he was never, the mobster himself was never really sort of pinned down for the murder itself. But people sort of, yeah, Slovakia is a small country, people know the who, who's who. They, they sort of connected the dots. And, and so once the murder happened, people really took it to the streets. And Fico was kind of panicked for a while and, and he saw it as a color revolution. I mean, that's how he sort of described it. And, and he started blaming George Soros and the US embassy and talking of, of a coup. He was eventually sort of convinced by his own party members and coalition partners that he needed to go. I mean, he looked like he was a person in sort of terminal political decline, so to speak. So he just became a regular MP. But then he managed to make this comeback last year on the back of this agenda of just sort of pro-Russian, anti-war, culturally conservative, vaguely nationalist rhetoric combined with sort of promises of you know, big, strong welfare state that will just care for, you know, his electoral base for people who are sort of left behind and, and haven't been the winners of the of the post-communist transitions. I mean, he is, you know, again, very good at sort of seizing these different topics and, and just running with them, you know, in a way that, that his base loves. He also, and, and I think this has been increasingly the case after this most recent election, has been very good at finding topics and figures in his governing coalition that he elevates, that he knows that the sort of urban educated elites will hate and it's a little bit like it's, it's very Trumpy in that sense that my Slovak friends have been talking about just, just sort of culture war issues which includes bear population in Slovakia has become a sort of culture war issue the fact that the new minister of culture who is this sort of retired TV host anti-vaxxer figure who is probably illiterate is basically making decisions about sort of grants for you know visual artists and, and, and doing sort of like critiques of theater performances and you know people in Bratislava who have college degrees Degrees and who are sort of consumers of arts and culture just can't stand this situation. And obviously, Fito's base just loves it that there's this sort of group of people being to- totally wind up. But but you can see how this dynamic basically like increases the pressure like within the sort of system to the point where like it's not unimaginable that somebody would just lose their nerve and get a gun and, and go and like shoot somebody. I'll defer to Yulia in a second, but I have to make at least one wise crack. It looks like every Trump needs a JD Vance and a carry Lake as a sidekick. But I did have one serious question. So it does seem like Fiso's life is not in danger, but we don't know how debilitated he may be. Is there a successor that is obvious? Not an obvious one. That would be my concern or concern. I mean, like, you know, if, if, if he were to sort of disappear from politics, the thing is that his sort of natural successor was Peter Pellegrini. He was number two in his party, but he kind of went in his own way, started his own political party, and he has now been elected the next president of the country. And I don't think there's anybody else within Smer, which is Fico's party, who would become the leader, but but I don't think they would have quite the same political weight and leverage and, and, and popular appeal. And given how personalistic politics is in Slovakia, there are very few parties that have outlived their founders. So I think it would really change the situation quite dramatically going forward. If Smer, the sort of largest party, were suddenly without its leader, who really has been the sort of central power broker of, of Slovak politics. I want to ask you also about what that means for Slovakia and EU elections, um, because it could have a major impact. But before we get there, tell us a little bit about the alleged assassin. Who is the guy and how should we understand where he's coming from? What drove him likely crazy from all this polarization that you're describing that, by the way, does sound a bit like if the United States were a small country, (laughs) there's a lot of parallels, certainly between what you're describing is going on in terms of tenseness and polarization and what we're having here. But let's stay with Slovakia and the assassin for now, or the alleged assassin. Uh, what can you tell us about him? I'll do that. But first I'll say, I mean, my hope for, for the United States is that the U.S. Secret Service seems better organized and more professional, I hope, than the protection officers that the prime minister 
had because you know I'm not no expert on the matter, but there was a lot of sort of like running around like crazy after the fact that didn't seem like something that they would have sort of you know rehearsed or trained for or, or prepared for. So so hopefully that actually contributes to you know the sort of decline. And I mean the U.S. had a period of political violence and assassinations, not just presidents and Robert Kennedy, etc., but but on a sort of lower scale as well. And and I wonder if sort of greater professionalism and more training and and just sort of procedures in place have thwarted and prevented some of that. When it comes to the shooter himself, so so what we know is that his name is Jan Chintula. He's from a small town not far from where, where the shooting happened. He uh, was 71 years old, retired, worked I think most recently as, as a security guard at a, at a supermarket. He was dabbling in writing poetry and fiction. He was even member of the Slovak Writers Guild, where you can sort of apply if you if you publish, I think, two books and pay a sort of nominal fee of a couple of euros. And I'm not sure how much is known about, you know, like we shouldn't be sort of talking about him as being crazy. Like, you know, I don't like diagnose people. You know, I'm not that kind of doctor anyway. But but he was clearly steeped and marinated in the sort of world of political information and political news. I must have been an avid consumer of all that stuff. He was at some point trying to start a political party that was paradoxically directed against violence and against polarization. That was maybe five years ago. There is open source information published by V-Square, a sort of excellent Hungarian investigative network that shows him being part of this pro-Russian, Russian adjacent group called Slovak Conscripts, which was later shut shut down. So that was around eight years ago that he was part of that. And now obviously after the election, he joined the ranks of those who were protesting against the pro-Russian government of Robert Fico, if you will. So, so it sort of complicates the picture a little bit. I mean, it sort of suggests that maybe he's been changing his mind or has been confused or, or whatnot, but he's been part of the public protest against the government in recent months. And there was also a recording done of him after the act in the corridor of a of a police station where he basically justified what he did by his opposition to to the government's policies so you know like what's sort of going on inside his head is kind of tough to to sort of understand properly quite yet maybe we'll know more as, as investigation is being done into his background and other activities on on the internet and and elsewhere but nothing to date suggests that this was part of some sort of conspiracy plot that there were other people involved he had a gun legally at at home. To me, everything suggests that this was sort of a lone person acting out of some impulse rather than a, a setup or a plot by, by anybody. The government is trying very hard to pin it on the opposition, though, as though the culture of division is entirely the responsibility of the, the opposition party. You know, again, I, I would defer to you, but just logically, the miasma that you described at the beginning sounds like a more powerful uh, explanation than, than any you know, like pending further knowledge about this guy. I think that's that's largely true, but I, w- I would qualify that a little bit. I think there are you know more and less responsible people, both in the opposition and and the governing coalition. One somewhat heartening event this morning was that the outgoing president, so we now have a sort of lame duck president who will be leaving office in in June, and and the president elect who is from one of the pro FISO parties is coming in. So they had a joint press conference, the joint statement condemning violence, basically calling for you know temperature to come down. So, I mean, there are sort of more responsible voices on both sides of the spectrum, if you will. But some of the loudest and most visible people in the governing coalition have already been calling for basically, you know, extraordinary wartime-like measures to crack down on the opposition, whom they blame for, for the assassination on, on media, which supposedly have been sort of heating up emotions around FITSO and, and, and the government policy. So a lot of that, I fear, will be used in the coming months to push Slovakia further down this route towards you know, sort of Orban-like illiberal democracy, if you will. And it's also likely to shape the European election in Slovakia. So there is some reluctance, I think, on the part of opposition parties to sort of campaign. It's, it's kind of you know awkward. To, they, they cancel some of the rallies. I think it's going to be difficult for them to get their message across. People will likely flock to these sort of parties of the, the governing coalition. And it is also likely that Russian disinformation outlets, which have a lot of reach and a lot of influence in Slovakia, will seize on this event. So already yesterday, like when you clicked on X or Twitter and you looked for, for Fico or Slovakia, you will have a torrent of stories, like all of them propagated by like fake anonymous accounts about how 
like this is being done to Fico because he stood up against the World Health Organization or because he didn't want to fund the proxy war in Ukraine and all kinds of sort of just made up fabricated lies and conspiracy mongering. And obviously I wish Fico well, but I have no illusions about the sort of rhetoric he'll pursue when he's back up and you know running as a political actor. Like he already had been sort of presenting himself as a, as, as a victim, if you will, of vicious media campaigns and an opposition. Like if he is actual survivor of, of an assassination attempt, I think that will very much strengthen his position politically and in sort of shaping the conversation in Slovakia. And I fear that it won't be for the good. So you're already diving into that. I guess I have two questions about how we can extrapolate what is happening in Slovakia to the upcoming EU elections. And the first one is to ask you more about how until now Robert Fico has been referring to the European Union, because that does play a big role in the position on war, in the position on COVID and all these other things in DC. Again, we don't focus that much on it because it's a bit blurred with EU and national governments and all of that. But because the EU is so central when it comes to financing, when it comes to EU funding, particularly for smaller countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the way Robert Fico, as well as pro-Fico parties, position themselves vis-a-vis the EU, whether as aggressive as Orban or a little bit of a muted rhetoric is is really important. But, But I also wonder, I guess, the broader question is to what extent does the situation that we have now in Slovakia in the context of this attempted assassination with Russian disinformation stepping right in, with people flocking to the pro fizo parties, how much is that an early taste of what you are expecting for EU elections? The EU elections are coming up in three weeks now, and while we know that Europeans overall are very focused on two big themes, similar actually to the United States, economy and migration, we also know that experts are anticipating a rise in the in Euroscepticism, populism, to some extent far right. So with the chaos that we have now in Slovakia, is that an early taste of what we should be expecting in more than one country in a couple of weeks? So I suppose the, the first thing is that the EU in Slovakia is broadly speaking popular. NATO is not popular. United States is disliked, but, but people like the EU, they want to be part of the EU, even extreme neo-fascist right, which is representative parliament, would not advocate for you know, Slovak exit from the EU and people appreciate the funding and access to the single market and, and, and so on and so forth. So there has never really been a sort of Eurosceptic movement in, in Slovakia per se, which is different from even Poland or Czech Republic. When it comes to Fico, you know, he is an effective political animal creature who's been very instrumental about the EU. So, so it was under his government that Slovakia joined the Euro ahead of other Central European countries, you know, ahead of schedule. We can debate whether to give him credit for that or whether to give credit to the previous government who had done all the necessary reforms. But, you know, he was not opposed to that. In sort of halfway through the, the last decade, he was also advocating for Slovakia to sort of make sure that, that the country be part of the integration core of the EU as opposed to the periphery, which again was, was just a sort of domestic political play more than anything. So so he is not intrinsically Eurosceptic or, or anti-European or, or anything like that. He is anti-American and he's been obviously seizing this issue of, of whether it's war or migration to sort of score political points against Brussels. He was also kicked out of Europe's political mainstream. So Merv's membership in the Socialists and Democrats or that sort of left-wing group in European Parliament has been suspended. What I think this will do in Slovakia is that obviously it will strengthen Smer's hand and, and the hand of adjacent political parties ahead of the European election. I think these voters, if they feel that you know they're under threat, that their leader is being shot at, will now be much more likely to show at the polls. You know, European elections sometimes are kind of an elite affair, like with very low turnout. Slovakia had very low turnouts. I think, I think the turnout might be higher this time, but but with thanks to people who would not vote for the uh, sort of centrist centrist parties necessarily, but rather for the parties of the of the governing coalition. And and I think this has the potential of spreading beyond Slovakia's borders and affecting the debate in places like Hungary, the Czech Republic and elsewhere, because I think the sort of shortcut that people will make in these other countries is that they'll 
I'll say, look, the sort of skeptics of the Ukraine war and of Brussels policies on migration are being, you know, killed and silenced and, and, and the sort of sense of victimhood and suppression of dissenting voices, you know, something very recognizable on the sort of MAGA right here. I think we'll, we'll sort of come much more fully to the surface, again, like mobilizing voters, strengthening the, the sort of anti-establishment, anti-establishment voices. So so I think, yeah, the European Parliament is, is on track to being more fragmented than it was before. I don't know, like, how big a role this assassination attempt will play in moving it in that direction, but it's certainly not the sign that of sort of things calming down or reverting back to normal. You have to wonder too whether it'll put some wind in the sails of like AFD in Germany or Hertwilders in the Netherlands, the culturally conservative nationalistic parties elsewhere. I'm, I'm pretty sure it will help and, and they will talk about it. And Orban already has been tweeting about his, you know, friend Robert Fito and so, so this sort of mantle of like being a victim in this culture war situations and being silenced and now being you know shot at it is powerful and you'll have these conspiracy stories filtering through national conversations from you know russia and, and, and elsewhere that will play a role in that as well dollar war has really been a tour de force presentation <laughs> i'm not kidding i'm super impressed to wrap up I want to bring you back to the tone of the piece you wrote the other day i'm not sure i'm quoting it 100 percent accurately we said you know sort of things will never be the same <laughs> it's just sort of gave me a feeling of Franz Ferdinand crossing the bridge in Sarajevo, although not quite as uh, necessarily guns of August as that. But what are your sort of worst case fears this might represent? Or, you know, again, just sort of try to tie it up in a bow for us. So I don't think it's going to be quite as momentous as, as the Sarajevo assassination. But it's it's a moment when I think for the second time in a row, Slovakia is kind of losing its innocence if there was ever such a thing. I mean, it, you know, like the Kuciaka and Kushnirva murder was, was, was a horrific thing. There were terrible things happening in the 1990s, including probably politically motivated murders and kidnappings and, and, and those kinds of things. But by and large, Slovakia is a there's a small and peaceful country, sort of land of the sort of little hobbits tending to their gardens and, and so on and so forth. And even in times of sort of totalitarianism, totalitarianism, whether of the sort of fascist variety or the communist variety, had a kind of domesticated bend. I mean, I don't want to like make excuses, like it was you know, horrifying both of these eras and, and sort of wartime Slovak state was, was terrible. But there was something to be said about the sort of smallness of it and the fact that you had, you know, both like communists and wartime fascists in the same families and sort of meeting in the same cafes and being part of the sort of same ecosystem. So so similarly, in today's day and age, there was this sort of sense that at some level, Slovaks are all in it together and you can't like escape one another. And I think some of that is sort of was already being lost in this escalating cold civil war and I think might be sort of gone for good. Obviously, it depends on what the political actors will make of it. But my fear is, again, like I don't want to say we are in the 1930s, like, you know, to some people, everything seems like a Reichstag fire and everybody is a, is a future Hitler. But this does provide an excuse to the governing coalition to do things that they would not otherwise be able to get away with doing, whether it's the foreign agents law, whether it's other restrictions on opposition media, etc., etc. So I am a little fearful about what the, what the sort of overall outcome of this is going to be for Slovakia and, and perhaps as a sort of source of learning for other budding authoritarians in the region and beyond. Dalbor, thank you for both loving and sobering analysis of seen in Slovakia. So for me, Giselle Donnelly, my colleagues, Dalibor Rohac and Yulia Zhozhra, I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on any podcast platform that's handy. I also would commend to you our newsletter, which will keep you abreast with the things that we publish and uh, create outside this podcast. The links will be in the show notes along, as promised, with Dalibor's analysis analysis of the Chitsa shooting. So thank you for joining us this time, and we hope to see you next time on the Eastern Front. Mm-hmm.